Barbara Cux left INSEAD in 1984 to work for McKinsey and was then hired by a client, ABB, to set up power plant joint ventures in Eastern Europe. She went on to global supply chain roles for Philips and Siemens and now sits on several boards including Henkel, Total and Umicore. Welcome to Alumni Experience, Barbara. You were hired by Siemens in 2008 to revamp their global supply chain and then the financial crisis hit. How did that affect you? What happened, of course, in 2008 in November, the crisis started. And some of our businesses had a reduction of the order entry by, you know, 20% or more. So we had to react. Well, normally, of course, it's great to take the so-called 100 days and then to start. But honestly speaking, we didn't really have it. And the other point was that I w really wanted to define the strategy and the objectives, not in a in my office, but I really wanted to do that jointly with the team to get the buy-in from the very start. And that's what we did. So middle of January, so you know, basically five, six weeks after my start, for the first time the top 100 in supply management in Siemens met. And together we defined the objectives for the next two years. And of course, each of them before leaving signed these objectives and committed to get it done. And I think, and that was the intention, it was a cold January. It was a bit, you know, it wasn't the sunny weather. But I can just tell you that 100 when they left, I saw some sparks in their eyes. And that was the purpose also of the meeting. When you change a supply chain, you are, you're changing the way things are done around here. Um, and I'm guessing you run into resistance. Did you, did you face a lot of conflict at Siemens, for instance? I don't really see a conflict because at the end of the day, we managed to get a double digit billion euro savings for the company. And, and that went into the pockets of the businesses, of the P&L of the company. So there was a really a great uh, benefit. How to do it? I mean, firstly, of course, to analyze the spend doing this kind of first diagnostic phase, which we didn't have much time because the crisis started then define the objectives, motivate the teams and, and implement. In a way, it's, it's rather simple, but certainly this productivity increase we got also to focus more and select in a better way the supplier and create strategic relationships. The other point, of course, was to expand the sourcing in the emerging markets, which we improved very substantially, which is key for the company also in the future for the growth in the emerging markets. And then lastly, e-auction, which we also increased uh, with, uh, with a very important percentage. So we set very concrete KPIs together with the teams and we achieved them. When you set out to be greener and more sustainable, you are, you're kind of taking a risk because you're making yourself a target in a way. Did you, did you worry about reputational risks at Philips and Siemens? But I can tell you the last 10 years, so the five years I spent with Philips and the five years with Siemens, the biggest worry I had was that, you know, one of our suppliers in an emerging market like China or India would have a problem. And not just having a problem, but also that it got into the media. And now, how to cover that? So then you think, this is the risk, so what do I have to do to address it? So it's very important because otherwise you are in a constant worry kind of state. And, and the solution was, of course, A, to really go through, again, the supplier selection, make sure that you know, we did the selection process very well and right. Secondly, make sure that all our suppliers, especially the ones in the risk areas, had signed our code of conduct. And then also we started that uh, to use external audit companies and they would then kind of a little bit help us to cover this risk. This idea of getting suppliers to sign a code of conduct and be audited, presumably it's okay to get 98%, but how easy is it to get actually 100% of your suppliers to do that? Well, it's very important to get everybody because typically what happens is exactly where you did not have this signature, uh, that's where then the incidents happen. And the point is you cannot tell the media, well, it's only a small supplier. You know, that will not help. <laughs> so. It's just so important that the teams understand how the implication could be for the company, that the teams understand that really on each level all their suppliers have, have done this. It's by the way also better for the suppliers because then they know what the standards are for that specific business. They have signed it, they have committed to it 
it's also better for the business relationship. So that's the way basically to have, have gotten it done. Let's talk about boards. How easy is it to go from being an executive with the power to just tell people what to do to go onto a board where you're more of a kind of overseer? It's very different roles. And I think what has been very good in my uh, development that I have been able to have the board experience in parallel to my executive role. For instance, with Total, it's now, I've just been re-elected. It's my uh, second term. I'm also in the governance committee uh, since a couple of weeks. So I have ha been able to have the experience in parallel. But it is a different experience. What I enjoy with the non-executive role is that, of course, it's a much more global view of the company. It's kind of the helicopter view on one hand. You really have to understand the total picture and the key priorities. You have to be extremely, let's say, good on the strategic side, because that's really where you know make or break the strategy happens. And then lastly, also make sure that the right people are at the right positions. And lastly, the compliance topics, which of course become more and more important. So ultimately, there must be issues, and maybe sustainability is one of them, where stakeholders just have different interests, whether it's shareholders, employees, whoever. And the board has to decide. How do you make those decisions? You know, at the end, it's always a balancing. At, I mean, sustainable companies, meaning companies that are successful in the long run, have always been trading off between, you know, shareholder interest, people interest, and also planet interest. I think they have always done that. So it's intrinsic, I think, in this. On one hand, of course, the financials have to be right, but you also have to ensure it's right for the people and it's right for the planet. I think it's a constant balancing that, that you do. And at the end of the day, it's not that difficult. We're sitting here in Fontainebleau, so let me ask you a question about INSEAD. How different has your career been as a result of studying here? Well, INSEAD has given me a lot. And it really has been the starting point of my, of my uh, professional development. And I see it really in three areas. The first one is to get the tools, to really understand you know, what does a general manager has to do in terms of strategy, financials, HR, and so on, to really get the tools, the toolbox. I think that's, that's key. The second one is the network. And it's really interesting. So one of my best girlfriends is Japanese. I know her through INSEAD. She's now a professor in Kyoto. And it's a, a great contact. I was in Brussels this week. I was in an elevator. And there was a, a nice gentleman who said, Barbara. And I looked at him, and it's a, a Polish doctor who did an MBA. And uh, he happens now to be a, a minister of the European Union delegated to the Pope on healthcare matters. So, I mean, it's such a fantastic network in different countries, in different eras, which is great. And the third one is teamwork. You know, the fact that uh, groups at, during the MBA course are, you know, specially structured in a quite a challenging way, I think really it helps to become a better team player. So these are the three things.